From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Well, good news. As we start the show today, there is currently not a nuclear war. Believe it or not, folks... Yeah, right. This is actually a thing that we check on right before we record these days. Uh, and uh, Matt, Noel, you can verify because right before we rolled, I, I had almost forgot. And I, I said, oh, wait, one sec. Let's check. Yeah, I have a Google notification set for uh, Armageddon, uh, nuclear holocaust, apocalypse, uh, nukes, duck and cover, you know, the big five. Uh, just to make sure uh, at all times that things are hunky dory, which of course they're not, but we're, we're at least not there yet, you know. But it does feel yeah, a little bit like a modern Cold War era with that level of fear kind of returning, doesn't it? Yeah, rest assured, though, you would get a notification on your phone of some kind of national alert moments before you're vaporized. So just <laughs> like, uh, okay. oh. Just like what happened in Hawaii, right? Can you imagine heart. getting that while you're on the can? And what do you do at that point? I guess, like, why hurry? You just own it. You just enjoy it. it you know, Just scroll on Reddit in the end. Last uh, so- Insta post <laughs> from the toilet. Yeah, sure, sure. There we go. And then at that point, you hope the bomb hits because you don't want that staying on. Uh, in an earlier listener mail segment, we ran into something quite interesting. We looked a bit into the dangers of nuclear war, the struggle for disarmament. We've also explored the nuclear black market, RIP to AQ Khan. We looked at the concept of mutually assured destruction or MAD. And we even, back in the day, looked at an ancient non man made nuclear reactor over there in Gabon. But we didn't ask this question. We've never asked this question yet how many nukes are actually out there? This it, this sounds like a little bit of a policy podcast, but there really is uh, some stuff they don't want you to know. So here are the facts. The world as we know it fundamentally changed on July 16th, 1945, with something called the Trinity Nuclear Test out in the Almogordo Test Range in New Mexico. They used plutonium to create a 19 kiloton blast This was the first ever official nuclear bomb. Uh, There's a fantastic graphic novel about this that, Matt, you introduced us to uh, called Trinity. It's wonderful. It's very much worth your time if you want a a fact-based exploration of both the science, the subterfuge, and... uh, and the problems with nuclear weapons. I hope that's not a hot take. Uh, but we've got quotes that can give you a little bit of a of a sense of just what it was like to be there at that moment in history. Maybe we start with uh, T.F. Farrell. Yes, this is a brigadier general on the staff of the Manhattan Project's military command. And here is the quote. No man-made phenomenon of such tremendous power had ever occurred before. The lighting effects beggared description. Beggared. That's a great uh, word. We'll talk about it after. The whole country was lighted by a searing light with the intensity many times that of the midday sun. Uh, So beggared. Uh, Beggared belief is how I've uh, heard that used before. Uh, And I guess it just means unable to come up with or unable to fathom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Unable to fully describe. (laughs) Yeah, like you not would, to be confused would, with buggered, which just means you know all yeah. foobard. Yeah, yeah, beggared. Just uh, in this in this case means that, like you said, Matt, it was almost impossible to articulate the full experience. Einstein warned about this. Even wrote letters to political leaders. It caused Oppenheimer who was a running point on the science part and the occult part uh, to contemplate religion, where he famously said. Uh, the line from, I believe, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Not long after, Uncle Sam dropped the first two nukes ever used in wartime in Japan, wreaking 
immense chaos in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, stuff that reverberates in the modern day. And you mentioned like a good sort of more documentary style, uh, nonfiction graphic novel in Trinity, right? Is that what it's called? Just Trinity? Yeah. I can't wait to check that one out. There's a absurdly stylized, uh, sci-fi-ified version of a similar story called The Manhattan Projects that I believe you've been read as well, Ben. That's quite good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those are those are both hits and they're they're important. You know, I would love for those graphic novels to be re, uh, read in schools and classrooms because I think it's an excellent way to learn. Um, but, you know, people are back to banning books. So get your copy of Mouse while you can. Uh, other countries. Say, yeah. yeah, right. Other countries saw this. They wanted in the game and they got in today's official nuclear powers are nine countries. We got China, India, Israel, Pakistan, France, the UK, North Korea, Russia, and of course, the good old US of A. We should put an asterisk by Israel, and we'll tell you what we mean by that in a second. Uh, Like we mentioned in our earlier segment, the two big dogs of the Cold War are the countries that had and continue to have the largest nuclear stockpiles. There are other countries that have pursued nuclear weapons. Iraq had a secret program. Iran is such a is continually accused of pursuing nuclear weapons. And then there were other countries that actually got to a nuclear state like Libya and later denuclearized um, for a few years there, as we as we found out earlier, Ukraine was technically a nuclear power. Um, but the thing is, when you ask how many nukes are actually out there, the question gets tricky because nuclear weapons need systems to get them to, you know, their desired target. And those systems, as well as those weapons, are not always created equally. Fellow North Korean, um, I don't know what you would call us, boffins, observers, I don't want to call us enthusiasts, Uh, you probably caught the news that DPRK and South Korea were in a, a bit of a ball swinging, (laughs) ball swinging missile testing interchange. Uh, North Korea just demonstrated its newest ICBM, the Hwasong-17. South Korea uh, also almost instantly responded with missile tests of their own. So what we're seeing is people signaling to the world, we don't just have the nukes, we have the way to get them to you in a matter of minutes. Uh, so it's it's scary time. It's scary time. Yeah. And we'll hit on Russia's newest uh, form of deployment probably towards the end of this. Because <laughs> in my mind, that's the scariest thing about this entire story. Absolutely. I mean, it also seems to me to be a bit of an issue of strategy, right? I mean, certainly there's maybe someone that knows, you know, at least in the countries that have – agreements, you know, in terms of like how many nukes they have to kind of know, but it doesn't seem like it would make sense to be super public knowledge, but somebody knows, right? How many? Uh, (laughs) Well, (laughs) uh, it'd be nice. It'd be nice if there was someone at the will, right? Uh, Luckily, one of the big reasons that you are listening to this podcast today and that everybody in the audience with us today is alive is due to, uh, I hate to say it, paperwork, very fancy paperwork, treaties. Bureaucracy has kind of kept the human race going for a minute. Uh, These, there are so many treaties about how nuclear weapons can be tested, how nuclear energy can be used, how it can be deployed. And there are a lot of treaties aimed at what we call denuclearization, getting people to Step back from having the world's most dangerous toy. Uh, The ultimate goal is a world without any nuclear weapons at all. That is a pipe dream. No, I'm just going to say it. It's not it's not going to happen. I I called it a fat chance, but it's not even that. So the the earliest example is something called the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. So this was specific to that part of the world. It was just 12 countries said, we're going to protect the peaceful status of Antarctica. That's why nobody, no country can own Antarctica. You can occupy it, you can research there, you can send people there, um, but they're they're kind of treating it the way they're supposed to be treating space. 
<laughs> but, it's uh, kind of weird, right? Uh, yeah. Like uh, mm-hmm. a continent that's so far removed from most of the nuclear powers. Like we're going to protect that place just in case <laughs> right. anybody decides they want to drop nukes on land and test them somewhere. Don't do it on the only, well, mostly, almost fully unoccupied continent. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And check out uh, Operation High Jump. That's something we might want to revisit. That's still such an interesting story. But maybe we talk a little bit about the most famous nuclear treaty in history, the MPT, Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, Entered force in 1970. Uh, Proponents will tell you overall it's been quite successful. Uh, It was extended indefinitely in 1995, so it's still in effect. And 191 countries, nuclear and non-nuclear, have signed on. So, like, if you're talking about how widely this applies, it's probably better just to list the countries who didn't sign on. And that would be India, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, and South Sudan. Um, And this agreement has several main components. Non-proliferation, which means not making any more nuclear weapons. Where, Where does the term proliferation come from that automatically associates it with nukes? Or does proliferation just mean not to to continue doing a thing? Yeah, proliferation is just rapid reproduction or rapid increase. Uh, And, you know, these these agreements are made to apply across multiple languages. So sometimes the words they have to use are very, very specific. That's why you'll hear – that's why you'll hear sometimes – LSAT or SAT, GRE kind of words, like uh, accusing someone of being bellicose. These bellicose actions are blah, blah, blah. When's the last time you were hanging out somewhere and you called a person bellicose? It's, I, I think it's a translation thing. Yeah, bellicose just means like aggressive kind of, right? Or Yeah, bellicose means you're being a, a, a jerk. Like you, a dick, you, yeah. You, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bellicose is like, why are you bucking at me? You know, it's like, Come at me, bro, energy. But uh, in this context, it is very, like you said, Ben, very clearly defined as a pledge not to transfer nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices to any recipient or in any way assist, encourage, or induce any non-nuclear weapon state in the manufacture or acquisition of nukes. So essentially, it's like, we're the club. We're the only ones that get the toys. If you give any toys to, you know, little Johnny um, or little Susie or whatever, then you're out. You, you, then you're like out in the cold. Guys, I have to do this so fast. I'm so sorry to all the Magic the Gathering listeners out there. You know the word proliferate oh because there's a, <laughs> there's Love an action it. in Magic the Gathering where if you proliferate, you add one more, you add an additional counter to any permanent on the battlefield that has a counter currently on it. It's a great word. Oh, it's uh, a scaling. Oh, that's well, it, it's like a biological term, really. I mean, at its heart, right. it's the idea of like um, self replicating almost, right? So like that makes sense. It's a scalable action where it adds one to, like, all of the things, right? Yeah, question uh, is, yeah, just so I understand, because this will be important for me later this weekend. Sure, does sure. proliferate, what, does that give a counter to every permanent or just one? You, as whoever is causing the proliferation gets to decide, like, I think, oh, God, that may be wrong. I think you get to decide, but uh, I may I may be incorrect there. It may just happen. It may be just something that happens. Oh my gosh! Permanent. While we're while we're on magic, let's give a big shout out to Kelsey, uh, who sent us a, a delightful, d- delightful care package from Hawaii, including also some uh, magic, some MTG conspiracy packs, which was right. a Heck big yeah. deal. I got a Birds of Paradise. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually I actually texted. I texted Matt. I was like, hey, can you send a picture of that card? And then I texted Kelsey. So thank you, man. We're so glad World War III didn't happen before that package got here. Uh, So as we're recording, trying to uh, get this episode out before the bombs drop, let's talk a little bit more about the MPT because you you nailed one of the big problems with it, Noel. Uh, So non-nuclear states on their end, they're promising not to get nuclear weapons, not to control nuclear weapons or any nuclear explosive device, and not to ask people, not to ask the haves 
for help in that regard. I like to call, they're, they're called the nuclear weapon states or NWS, but I like to call them the Nuki boys. Uh, the Nuki boys have this agreement that they're not going to use their big guns against any non-nuclear party. It's not necessarily a country, but also like terrorist, uh, except in response to a, a preceding nuclear attack or an attack that takes place in concert with a nuclear weapon state, with another nuky boy. This isn't hard or fast. Uh, this is kind of like a gentleman's agreement, and it can change over time. So that's a really dangerous one. That's like, for example, yeah. the language is confusing, right? But for example, that means like um, the U.S. won't deploy nuclear weapons in, you know, Nicaragua, right? Because Nicaragua is not a nuclear weapon state, but uh, if there is a conventional attack on the U.S. that is, for some reason, sponsored by France, that's another nuky boy. And so the U.S. could say, hey, France, what's up? Let's have some grown folk talk. Do you think Tolkien was thinking about nukes when he, when he envisioned the rings of power? I feel like that's true because it's like everyone gets one. All the different races get a piece, you know, and it makes them sort of on an even playing field. But then the big bad guy forges the really scary one that will counteract all the other ones. He doesn't play by the rules, you know, like that's sort of the deal. You know what I should say, though, because I'm thinking back, no, I think it 100 percent makes sense as an analogy, but I'm pretty sure Tolkien started writing um Writing Lord the of the 30s, Rings, I think, right? But yeah, before the Manhattan Project, but he couldn't have made a more perfect comparison. That's absolutely true. <laughs> so, so then there's let's talk about the other thing: disarmament. This is the big one. It's meant to stop the nuclear arms race. It's meant to clear a path toward a nuke-free world. Not going to happen. Definitely not anytime soon. Uh, and it's a subject of great debate. But to be fair. Both Russia and the U.S. have actually stepped down a lot of their total stockpile over the course of the Cold War. Uh, that's good news, but it's maybe not as fantastic news as we think because the – well, you'll see in a second. The amount of deployed weapons has increased. So you've got less guns in the garage, but you're carrying more every time you walk outside. That's, that's a way to Deployed put it. doesn't mean launched at you. It just means yeah. out and ready, right? Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's like Little Caesars has 100 pizzas in the store, but 30 are hot and ready. I should probably have eaten <laughs> breakfast before I recorded. Anyway, there's the third one. This pizza, is pizza. the other. <laughs> yes, there's this is the other one. This is the sticky one. So the peaceful use of nuclear energy. This says, OK, everybody has the right to develop nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. And as long as they're not using this nuclear tech to make nuclear weapons, jolly good. We're all copacetic. As a matter of fact, the Nuki boys can help you build things like light water reactors. There's a problem with this because we've talked about it before this is dual use technology. The same stuff you would use to build a peaceful nuclear power plant is the same stuff you would use to build a very dangerous weapon of mass destruction. So, like you have to use your about enrichment, yeah. right? Is, right? Is it about in levels of enrichment? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's about the cycle of enrichment. Uh, for instance, you have to have uranium to power a light water reactor, which means you have to be able to buy the stuff, which means someone has to sell it to you. Uh, there's a whole regime of international monitoring, but. Eh, you'll see. Mixed results. So anyway, at first glance, those are a few loopholes, imperfections, maybe purposeful imperfections in these agreements. And that leads us to the most troubling question about nuclear weapons. How many are out there? In a very real way, this is the stuff they don't want you to know. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, uh, check to see if the nukes have dropped, and hopefully we'll be back. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. Can I get out uh, from yeah. under my desk now? Okay? <laughs> right, we, we did. Good? We just did, okay. did the nuclear drill. Uh, some of some of our fellow '90s, '80s babies and older may remember that one. It was great fun. I guess those desks were more sturdy back then. But when we ask how many nukes are out there, the problem is 
we can guess, and experts can make some very smart guesses, but we can't know. There's not a way to, there might be intelligence agencies that know, but they're not going to tell you because then they would have to implicitly reveal that they have access to something. So we don't know. The public won't know. So, so, so it's not a condition of these treaties to disclose this. It's more of a general overarching agreement to like not make more than you have, but you don't have to give us an inventory of what you've got. Uh, due to it, another treaty, a couple like the U S depending on the administration will sporadically disclose. Russia has disclosed at different times, but it's, it's sticky. We'll see why. Yeah. And again, you're, you're strategically disclosing a number of weapons, you know? I mean, come on. And that was back in 68. And then 90, 1995 is when the NPT was like put into in perpetuity mode. So it's just, I don't know, whatever. It, I don't think anybody is saying exactly how many nukes they've got, even with the numbers we're about to give you, because this is our, this is the humanity's best guess. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. It's humanity's collective best guess. It's our game show thing. So it, if you want to answer the question and get into the, kind of the, the secrecy and the cover-up and sort of the conspiracy regarding nuclear weapons, it really depends on how you frame what you're asking. It may uh, amuse some of us. It may scare some of us to understand that the nuke game is way, way sloppier than the evening news may make it appear. Humanity has repeatedly come close to fumbling the ball in the, like the most dangerous game. Uh, yes, first off, right? We all know nuclear weapons are potential world enders, but humanity has managed to lose a few. Not, not as uh, some like Machiavellian 4D chess move, but just because people are great at losing stuff all the time. Where are your keys? Do you know where your keys are right now? That happened like six times with nuclear weapons. They're called broken arrows. No one knows where they are. There's one that's actually uh, off the coast of Savannah here in our home state of Georgia. You guys heard about that one, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that uh, 90s movie with uh, John Travolta and maybe Christian Slater, I think, yes. called Broken Arrow? Yes, that's I what do. it was about. Yeah. It Don't was no let face John Travolta off, was have a nuke. Yes. <laughs> okay. I can't remember if he was about Don't let him take your girlfriend out on a date while you're out of town because she will overdose on heroin. Oh, it's going to happen. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then Battlefield Earth. So <laughs> there was that. <laughs> there was that. Uh, what a checkered career that man has had. Fascinating. Was, yeah. Uh, but. Like you said, Matt, you nailed the other problem with the question. There are countries don't always tell the truth about their nukes. Like Emily Dickinson style, they're very nuanced at times about the truths they do tell. And then third, different nuclear weapons sometimes get excluded and or included in the official tally. It's like going to, I, I got to stop with the food examples. It's like going to a car dealership and saying, uh, how many cars do you have? Or better yet, it's like saying, how many vehicles do you have at this dealership? And they say, well, we have 35 trucks from 2018. And you know that there are sedans there. They're in the lot. And you're like, no, 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 dude, how many vehicles? <laughs> and they're like, well, we have a uh, pretty hefty collection of sedans. And you're like, okay, so that <laughs> plus the trucks. And they're like, well, it's time for us to close shop for the day if you're not going to buy anything. So nuclear weaponry is not the same. And, and that's actually a fairly okay analogy. The two big determining factors are the yield, the amount of damage that can be done by a successful de detonation, and the distance, how far this thing can go. Is it launching on like a more conventional missile system or is it on an ICBM and pretty much able to hit anywhere in the mm -hmm. world? So we really got to just quickly talk about the uh, the actual nuclear explosion or the atomic explosion or the thermonuclear explosion that can occur within a nuclear weapon and then the delivery system, because that's really what we're talking about here. If you go back and you look at the first two 
uh, nuclear weapons that were ever used, the atomic bombs dropped on Japan by the United States. You're talking about uranium-235 that we've discussed before. That's, the, that's why the centrifuges are so important. You spin up uranium until it gets to what, they, what would be called uranium-235, and you actually shoot uranium into itself to make a nuclear pew, pew, explosion. Pew. But that occurs just inside the, the bomb itself. How do you actually get that bomb to the place that you want to drop it? Uh, th- that's what we're talking about right here. Yeah. Yeah. So the two big flavors that get brought up the most are tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons. And you nailed the definition, Matt. Uh, let's talk about the tactical ones first. They're sometimes called TNWs, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, they're going to be, they can be launched from land, air, or sea. If they're launched from the air, we're talking a range of about 300 miles. And if they're launched from air or sea, think about it like 400 miles or uh, 500 kilometers for land and 600 kilometers for uh, air and sea. So these are easier to build, first off, because they have to do less work, right? Uh, But they're also the least regulated category of nuclear weapons. That's, that's one of the, uh, (laughs) that's one of the big problems. Uh, And then long range stuff, like the strategic stuff is meant to target bigger things, cities, military installations, points of infrastructure. It makes a big, big difference because again, when you hear someone estimating the number of nukes out there, you have to be very careful. Are they are they separating these two groups? Are they talking about weapons that are deployed, hot and fresh, ready to go? Are they talking about stuff that's in storage or has been mothballed? And well, we'll see. Those are just some of the problems. But here's the number. Here's the official number. According to some of the best guesses out there, the world currently has somewhere between 12,700 nuclear warheads to just north of 13,080. All in. That's that's the guess. Uh, and that is as of 2022. So that's as of this year. So the Arms Control Association, um, just a couple months back in January 22, released a list citing U.S. and Russia as the big boys. Uh, U.S. has, uh, according to their uh, estimates, 5,550 warheads, while Russia has 6,257, which is 90% of the unofficial overall global tally. Um, But as we talked about in the previous episode or in our previous discussion of this uh, at some point recently, um, just having them doesn't mean they're ready to go. Your little Caesars analogy holds true, Ben. You've got a freezer full of these, you know, frozen rectangular nuclear pizza pies. uh, And then you've got the ones that are like already hot, ready in the box, ready to ship out, you know, and feed the masses or, you know, blow them up. Um, Same deal. So the U S currently, has deployed, uh, as in hot and ready, uh, 1,357, and Russia has 1,456 uh, strategic warheads on several hundred bombers um, and held within missiles um, and are modernizing their nuclear delivery systems. And both are, are trying their damnedest to modernize their nuclear delivery systems. But again, another thing that we talked about recently is We don't know what state of repair some of these devices are in, especially when it comes to Russia, because they're known for being, you know, technologically savvy, but also that a lot has to do with sometimes they're not exactly known for being like precision engineers. They're definitely a little fast and loose with how quickly they push out tech. uh, And sometimes that can lead to, you know, disastrous results like with, uh, you know, what was that? The the space dog. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or with a Challenger uh, space program in the U.S. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is 100%. Like, ev- yeah. every country is like pushing the edge of technology as far as it can possibly go to the point where it breaks, right? Um, it's just, I, I, uh, I don't want to push back too hard on that, Noel, because I, I, I agree with you. It's just I think the U.S. is probably in the same boat when it comes to a lot of the older uh, nukes that we had around since you know the I think 1940s. you're probably right. I'm not meaning to unfairly malign Russia's technical savvy. No, I know. Obviously, they're very technologically savvy. We know in terms of their ability to 
you know, do, um, you know, wage information wars and do, yeah. you know, uh, very high level hacking attacks. I just have a feeling, you know, there is sort of like, like, you know, if I mentioned even like synthesizers and certain Russian uh, technology is cutting edge, but also notoriously cantankerous in terms of like being able to repair or, you know, going on the fritz periodically. Dude, sure. Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, just the only thing is like, how many nukes do you actually need to start a full-on nuclear war? And just to like, the one, you know, <laughs> the one that do, the one that goes boom. <laughs> yeah, that's the tricky part. It's a great question, Matt. Just the one, really. Uh, so, <laughs> the the there's also something we should talk about here, which is there's a difference in policy, or you could even say a difference in philosophy, and and it all comes from a rational standpoint if you know the perspective of the actors involved. But these differences often lead to ambiguity, and this ambiguity is a huge monkey wrench when we're trying to suss out nuclear weapon counts. I mean, here's the deal. Let's say let's say we're playing uh, Uno. We're all playing Uno, and one of us knows that we have a couple of, like, kick-ass draw fours. We have three in our hand. But we know that other people in the game that are playing with us also may have some – Draw fours, you know, the good kind that go for any color, right? The, and uh, we, if possible, we want to save our super card for the best moment and want it to be a surprise. Like the inventor of Uno, Sun Tzu, once said, keep them guessing, right? And don't fact check that. Uh, so it's... <laughs> But it's the same with military capability. It's kind of like a, a game of Uno. That's why the DPRK or North Korea doesn't disclose how many nuclear weapons it has. Uh, analysts have to guess instead based on how much fissile material they think that government has created. The actual size of their stockpile, people have no idea. Maybe 40, maybe 50, who knows? Uh, and then Israel has for many years been the <laughs> been the cheerful keeper of the world's worst open secret in in nuclear technology. They've never officially acknowledged that they have a nuclear weapons program, but everybody knows. And they're fine with everybody knowing. They just don't talk about it. Uh which is a pretty um it's a pretty interesting stance, this nuclear ambiguity, and it's something that a lot of other countries seem to have accepted. Ben, it's so weird. I was, I, we've talked about that for so long, like the just best kept open secret that Israel has here. And you posted a an article from Scientific American, but I think it was from Live Science. I it was kind of a little weird in some of those articles where it's like cross posted. Yeah, but uh, there are just there are experts who just say it now. Like yeah. Israel definitely has nukes. Uh, they just don't talk about it. They don't acknowledge it. And, right. and I remember before when we were researching this stuff, it was kind of like a, it was felt more hush hush to me. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, yeah, and Israel's got nukes, whatever. Yeah, I think a lot of academics and other politicians have been more open about it because uh, politicians in Israel itself were more open about it. You know, they're not making official statements or necessarily. Uh, propagating a lot of documentation about it, but there are plenty of interviews where they are very much acknowledging, at least tacitly, this stuff. And, you know, the world, at least in terms of the public sphere, may never have known about that program if it weren't for the whistleblower, Mordecai Venunu. Uh, he's a former nuclear tech working in Israel. He is still alive today. He spent like more than a decade in solitary confinement. He definitely, he was, he definitely met with consequences for going public. Um, but, but in this case, you know, especially for this show, that transparency is important. Even we, we can understand the logic of ambiguity. The one that a lot of people are worried about right now, surprisingly, is not, not just Russia. The nation of China is also a black box. Experts have estimated the country might have around 350 warheads in total, but that's still kind of a guess. Uh, the, you know, I think what we do here is maybe we pause for a word from our sponsor and then we return with some bad news. Is that too soon? No, let's let's get let's get the bad news going, man. 
And we've returned. So there is one thing for sure. And it's kind of the bad news for a lot of observers. Without knowing exactly how many nuclear weapons China has in its stockpile, we do know that there are going to be a lot more uh, in the near to mid future. Arms Control had a great quote on this. Quote, in 2020, the U.S. Department of Defense estimated that China had an operational nuclear warhead stockpile in the low 200s, but projected that number could double over the next decade. Uh, China has since accelerated its nuclear development, and the Defense Department estimates as of 2021 that China may have up to 700 deliverable nuclear warheads by 2027 and 1,000 by 2030. Zoiks and jinkies. And that doesn't necessarily qualify as proliferation because they're not giving them to other countries. These are these are homemade toys. Uh, but it's true. And then the other complicating factor, we mentioned this just a second ago, we might be overestimating the nuclear capabilities of some states, right? People may, for instance, due to ambiguity, overestimate the size of Israel's nuclear stockpile. And with Russia, the world may be overestimating how much of that stuff is actually usable because the invasion of Ukraine showed that Russia has some serious infrastructure, hardware, maintenance problems. So they may have a lot of nuclear weapons on paper, but we have to ask how many have the infrastructure to deploy successfully at range. While that's an important point to bring up, it's even more important to say that they'll definitely have some that work. You know, they'll, they'll definitely still have more than the vast majority of countries, including the other Nuki boys. I got to let go of the phrase Nuki boys. I think it reminds no, me. No, no. I mean, you Dukey? need to own it. Lean into who, it. It's beautiful. Who were those prank callers? Duke though? Nukem. Duke Nukem. That's oh, good. <laughs> remember Duke Nukem, the, the video game? Mm-hmm. I'm also, there was a, like some prank callers. Uh, they, they, they like had albums where they prank called people. They were like the Dookie. Oh, the Jerky Boys. Jerky, the jerky boys. boys. The Jerky <laughs> Boys. Okay. That was in the era of like the first Adam Sandler comedy record. It was a golden time for raunchy comedy CDs. It really was. Hang on. I have to look. Is, is Dookie Boys a thing? Nookie yeah. Boys is not a thing. Okay, but Dookie Did Boys. Did you say jerky Dookie boys. boys or Nookie Boys? Dookie okay. Boys is a thing. Okay. Is it? Mm-hmm. I've never heard of the Dookie From Boys. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So we've solved that. Uh, we'll get the we'll get the Jerky Dookie Treaty out uh, next week. But this this means Okie Dookie Okie Dookie <laughs> Okie Dookie. Uh, so this uh, this means that it's not difficult for us to understand why some nations would want to play their mass destruction cards so close to the chest. It also means it's almost certain that intelligence agencies may have a closer guess, like we talked about, a more sophisticated picture, but they can't, they can't go public with that. One, it removes an advantage they have, right, in terms of visibility. Two, it uh, opens them to the risk of having their collection methods compromised. And three, it might just be the unexpected feather that see, that breaks the camel, you know, the 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 rock that sinks the boat. Maybe maybe just like when people's parents pretend they don't know their kid is smoking weed. It's just better to like have a practiced sort of blindness about it. At least that's let one of the sleeping bongs things. lie. Yeah, they say just so. So now we have to. Talk about the future. We've given you some of the best guesses on how many nuclear weapons exist. We've talked about the problems with that question and how you have to, you know, the dealership vehicle, truck, car thing. Uh, But now we have to talk about the future. So despite the good faith efforts of people around the planet for decades, nuclear relations remain incredibly tense. And that treaty we mentioned itself, the NPT, the most famous of its kind, has some big flaws. Non-nuclear powers see it as the haves, the Nuki boys, keeping the have-nots down. They're saying, look, you are, you are benefiting from this, right? You are hegemons. In many cases, your former colonial powers Why do you get to control the world this way? And for this reason, because of this kind of rationale, 
you can see how a lot of non-nuclear states may think the path to becoming a superpower is to have the same guns as the superpowers. And now more than ever, it's possible to do so because that the technology has spread, the scientific discoveries have spread. People can enrich uranium, or countries, I should say, can enrich uranium while dodging those inspection regimes. Uh, you can also step out of the MPT. You can use that. Um, you can use that third platform we were talking about, assistance with nuclear power, peaceful nuclear research, and you can get right to the brink of developing nuclear weapons. And then once you get to that line, the treaty no longer serves your purposes. You can withdraw. Just start building some bombs. You can pull a psych just like as if you were in the 1990s or early 2000s. And there's nothing much that the rest of the <laughs> treaty signatories can do. Oh, that would take a minute you. to wash over me, Ben. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is psych like you were in the early 2000s, <laughs> the late 1990s. Well, I just remember it's not, it's not only uranium, it's plutonium. It's several other mm -hmm. uh, fissile materials that can be spun up and used to make these kinds of weapons. And the most powerful ones that have ever been exploded used a combination of different uh, materials to actually cause a fusion reaction. Uh, like it, it, nuclear energy really does scare me in that way because it seems as though the, the scenario you're describing, Ben, is very much possible and probably rational. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching <laughs> you. And then... Slap. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. there's there's going to be a big problem down the road, quite likely. I mean, not many people can successfully predict the future, but if you look at the signs, you know, there's something in the wind nowadays. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran have all already laid out the terms under which they would leave the treaty and pursue nuclear weapons. So – they like it's already something countries are planning on. And this is a glass house situation. The big dogs, the Nuki boys get a loophole too. There's a great article on Slate from Fred Kaplan, which notes the problems with um, disarmament. It's, it's uh, article six of the MPT. And it means that countries that have nukes have to start stepping down their stockpile. And it's like a, it's like a, a a show of good faith, right? But it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it is written, back to the language here, it is written in a kind of a weaselly way. Sort of like um, the founding fathers wanted all the people in the U.S. to have the um, right to the pursuit of happiness. You know what I mean? We're not saying it's going to work out, but go nuts. We got we we got your Go back. Ahead, on give that it a try. Part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the. Um, so I think it's maybe let's quote directly from Kaplan here because I I think we all quite like the way he puts it. Quote: It states that the five nuclear countries will uh, internal quote <laughs> undertake to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective means relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date. Let's try this one more time. Um, that's not a cessation to the arms race, but the intention literally quote means relating to cessation. Uh, you know, you hear about cessation in terms of like quitting smoking. It's like, I express my intention to quit smoking and all the things adjacent to that, except the act itself. <laughs> right. Right. It's and like then, when you quit smoking yeah. by bumming off of everybody else all the time, that's not actually quitting smoking, but it's an intention by not buying cigarettes and just, you know, impinging on the kindness of your friends. Um, but you're still not doing the thing that you're actually, you know, that's sort of at the heart of, of the, uh, the conversation. Yeah. Or like, okay, I'm going to stop carrying a cigarette lighter around with me. I'll still have smokes, but I'll only carry it or, uh, you know, I'll, I'll rely on the kindness of strangers. And then also like not saying to act, not committing to actually hold negotiations, but to undertake to pursue negotiations, which is the same thing as saying, you know what, we should hang out. Or, or even worse, it's like saying, you know what, one day 
I should think about asking that person to hang out. And then we can work out the details, you know, um, at an early date. Damn. You know, an Damn. Early, okay. Anyway, so that that's the problem. That's why <laughs> that's why a lot of non-nuclear states have a have a valid concern when they say we don't think these countries are holding up their end of the bargain. And the US also has made like bilateral agreements that critics say are, are weakening these treaties. It's just a mess of spaghetti, man. It's a whole bag of badgers. So that's that's where it leaves us, but there's still there's still more out there. There's more that you need to know about this. Well, you're saying like in a matter of minutes. So this is what I just want to harp on this for just a little bit, guys. How long it would take, how a nuke would get to you or to a place on the world and where it would explode. I want to jump to that article, How Many Nuclear Weapons Exist and Who Has Them, from Live Science, written by Joe Felon. Uh, oh, that's a great name, Joe Felon. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's pronounced a determinism going on there. I think it's pronounced Felon, maybe? Phelan. Phelan. All right, fine. That would be cool. It was DJ Joe Felon. All right, so um, <laughs> there's there's a person <laughs> that Joe consulted for this story named Matt Corda, who's a senior research associate and project manager for the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. I just want to read to you some of what Matt said when it comes to deployment, how nukes would actually get to you. Um, he says, the U.S. and Russia keep a portion of their nuclear weapons on prompt alert, meaning they could be ready to launch in, quote, under 15 minutes. So launching nukes in under 15 minutes. And there's a 2015 paper that was created by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, and they're saying that U.S. and Russia have around 900 weapons of such capacity ready at any time. So 15 minute launch and it's out. Uh, and that includes stuff that's like ballistic missiles inside silos. That includes uh, missiles that could be launched from the air from like a MIG uh, fighter jet if it, you know, if it was able to deploy at a certain range. It also has to do with submarines and I think it's Corvette class uh, naval ships that can also shoot these ballistic style missiles. Mm. Uh, so that's one thing, right? About 900 each that exist. But the scariest thing to me is the hypersonic missile system that Russia has been testing and recently deployed. As of last week when we're recording this, Russia claims to have deployed one of their hypersonic missiles. These things travel at Mach 6, which is six times the speed of sound, like up to, right? So it might be around Mach 5 actually traveling. They allegedly have a range of 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles. Before we were talking about generally ballistic missiles being able to travel, I think, for around 400 miles, Ben. Uh, these things can travel 200 miles more than that. And the scariest thing about them is that when they're flying through the air so quickly, they generate a plasma. What is it? I'm going to read from this. Uh, this is from military.com in an article titled Why Russia's Hypersonic Missiles Can't Be Seen on Radar. Uh, when these missiles are traveling through the air, it creates a plasma shield at the front of it because the air gets superheated and you can't see them on radar and they travel at Mach 6. So we've got these like, um, if you imagine the Aegis missile interceptor system, which the United States uses and several other countries use, we deploy it in other places. If this hypersonic missile is traveling at you... <laughs> Uh, there's, there's eight to 10 seconds that that missile interceptor system needs to be able to track a thing and then send a missile out and catch it and destroy it in that eight to 10 seconds. These hypersonic missiles will have traveled 20 kilometers and the missile itself that the Aegis system would deploy cannot catch up to that hypersonic missile. True. It can't. So you can't stop it. By the way, what happens when a nuclear weapon is detonated like over the ocean? I mean, it's obviously better than hitting its direct target, but still probably not great, right? I mean, we got an episode on the Marshall Islands if anybody wants to be depressed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, the Vela <laughs> yeah. incident is another example. Um, water, water is a okay way to buffer stuff, but it still has enormous consequences. It's still very nasty business. There's not really a good place to drop a nuke is what we're saying. And now the 
<laughs> the delivery systems are so good. I would only add that um, hypersonic missiles have the ability to change direction once they're launched, which ballistic usually yes. doesn't. So, yeah, they can. Yeah, ballistic is like launch it mm-hmm. and then it goes. Uh, but these hypersonic missiles, just in my mind, are terrifying. I don't know and I cannot confirm if there are any nuclear warheads attached to any hypersonic missiles that are like currently deployed and ready to use. But Russian naval ships can, a specific class of Buyan class naval ship, can carry around 25 of these hypersonic missiles. And their MiG 31K fighter jets can carry these things. Uh, and, it, you know, it, to me, that's my nightmare fuel is a hypersonic nuclear missile that nobody can stop. We know it's happening. And then somebody on either the U.S. side, the Israel side, the U.K., somewhere has to decide while that thing is flying through the air in only a couple of minutes to counterattack. Right. It's like the the person who has to make the decision. Do I launch a nuke? I see that one coming. I can't stop it. Do I launch nukes? That is terrifying to me. Yeah, especially considering China is super active in research on this. They've got a hypersonic glide vehicle. Uh, They also created something called the Starry Sky 2. Uh, Just to go ahead and make sure I further ruin your day, Matt. It's called the – translates like the Sing Kong 2. In Mm -hmm. 2018, this was a nuclear-capable hypersonic vehicle – and it was successfully tested. Uh, U.S. has also messed with this, obviously. Uh, India, France, Germany, Australia, and Japan are also developing hypersonic weapons. Uh, and, you know, you, it would be naive for us to assume that none of those would be nuclear capable. And hypersonic missiles, like you mentioned, Matt, as of just a few days ago, have been used in combat. Russia deployed them. Uh, there are, I, I was seeing a, suggestions that the reason Russia deployed these weapons, they were not nuclear, they were just hypersonic, but I'm seeing the Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. people saying that they launched them because they ran out of their other stuff, that the stockpile was low. But we need more confirmation on that. In the meantime, stay safe, everyone. We can make a kind of good guess about how many nuclear weapons are out there. And for a little while, there was a halcyon optimistic era wherein we could try to predict paths toward partial disarmament. But now it looks like at least some countries are going to actively create more nukes and definitely create more ways to get them to you in a matter of minutes. So how many exactly are on the way? That, for now, is the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, But I don't know how to end these episodes, you know, when we're like, well, here's the future. No one knows. No one's in charge. And if things launch, there's not much you can do. It's like what, like, you know, like a nuclear, uh, a nuclear bunker, a nuclear shelter. I'm sure a lot of our like preppers in the audience have thought of this, but I don't know if most people have. If you have a nuclear bunker, you have to always be close to it for it to be useful, right? Especially with hypersonic stuff. You hear hypersonic missiles are launching and you go to book a flight to Montana or wherever your bunker is. It's too late, right? Yeah, I mean, by then you've already gotten the the ding ding on your phone and you're on the toilet and, you know, it's like, okay, well, I guess this is me now. And then next thing you know, you're like Pompeyed, you know, mm-hmm. but on the toilet. It's going to be my last, my last stage in uh, Angry Best Fiends. It's going to be my last Best Fiends game. And I'm sorry, not to get end on a super bummer note, but it's like we've seen dramatizations of what what it would look like if a nuke hit. Everything from Terminator 2 when you see Sarah Connor shaking the the playground, you know, um, chain link fence and then getting um, vaporized into a screaming skeleton, you know, that then turns to dust and blows away. Uh, If you've seen the uh, very depressing yet beautiful um, anime Barefoot Jin um, or uh, The Grave of the Fireflies. You see some of the consequences of more like radiation poisoning. Um, Barefoot Jin in particular has some really gnarly, eviscerating kind of like images of what would happen. What would really happen, though? Would you just get kind of vaporized uh, if it was a direct hit? You would, right? If it was a direct hit, you would just get turned to ash and blow away. Yeah, if you're like ground zero, it would depend on the yield, um, but without sounding 
too morbid. I, I think many people, when they look into the reality of what happens in the aftermath, uh, many people might make the choice to just go for a quick death rather than try to navigate fallout and radiation and chaos and collapse of government. Um, but you know what? There we go. We got there. Noel, thank you. Now we have a question to ask our fellow conspiracy realist. What would you do in, in the event of an imminent nuclear attack? Depending on how much time you had, how would you prepare? Are you one of the people who, if you learned about it while it was occurring, like literally an alert on your phone, would you want to survive knowing that that survival could quite possibly lead to a terrifying existence? Let us know. Or, you know, also just send memes. Who can't use a good meme in these trying times? Uh, we love to recommend our Facebook group, Here's Where It Gets Crazy, where you can check out some good memes. We've got a conspiracy stuff YouTube channel. Big things on the way there. Check it out. Uh, we're also on the Instagrams, the Twitters. We're not on eChirp, uh, but a lot of our <laughs> a lot of folks reached out to us to tell us we're not missing much, which I found comforting. Oh, and if you hate social media, because you checked out our big data episode and you're like, I'm not sipping those meads anymore. Uh, there's good news. You can also contact us via our telephone line. That's right. Give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. When you call in, let us know how you pre-ordered our book which is coming out in October, but you can pre-order it right now. <laughs> Tell us which method you used to pre-order our book. We want to know. We're curious. Um, when you call in, please give yourself a cool nickname, and you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. At some point, please give us permission, or not, to use your voice and message on the air in one of our listener mail episodes, or wherever. We're going to use it worldwide in perpetuity. We got your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you if you don't want to do any of that stuff let us know if you've got maybe an old nuclear missile silo or another form of bunker that the three of us can come you know and visit maybe hang out with you when the world starts to end I don't know uh, we'd love to know about your bunker situations <laughs> yes. uh, so you how good is your Wi-Fi you got that good yes. bunker Wi-Fi yeah. yeah use it uh, to, to, to send us a good old fashioned email we are Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.